So thank you for this opportunity. And I always, uh, I, I tell this to RP, I use these forums uh, always to, uh, you know, catch myself up on the latest trends. Uh, every time I pick up a topic, which is, which is, uh, which is something that I've steered away from for, a, for, for some reason, you know, it gives me an opportunity to research about the topic and learn along the way. You know, I, I think the best form of learning is when you, when you, uh, you know, when you present it to, to an audience. So thank you. Uh, this may not be a perfect presentation, but I think it, it, this will be my, my attempt to touch on a topic which we don't, as, a, as marketeers, touch upon too often, right? So uh, I'll start with, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, a, a product life cycle. Uh, I think you, mo most of you would have heard of a product life cycle, uh, uh, you know, and go to take, go back 15 years, 20, you know, or 10 years. Uh, traditionally, your marketing was aligned to a product life cycle. When uh, you know, it, you know, it, your 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 product would start from a product development stage to introduction to growth, maturity, uh, and, and decline. You would typically align your marketing strategies to your your product. Uh, uh, and also, uh, 10, 15 years, your audience behavior was not changing as drastically as your product was. So you were always ahead of the curve. Uh, when you were building on your marketing plans, right? But can you blow up the Sorry? Can you go on slideshow mode? Oh, sorry. This was also okay, but uh, slideshow would be slightly better. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Is it better? Yes. Cool. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I, I, so what has happened? And I was talking to one of uh, uh, one of the Gartner analysts, beginning of this year, and, and he he explained to me a very very interesting uh, uh, point. He said, if you divide the last two decades into two broad buckets of uh, uh, you know evolution, you know innovation evolution, the first decade, say twenty twenty to sorry twenty uh, uh, two thousand to two thousand ten uh, would would be dedicated to the internet boom, where we moved from 2G to 3G to 4G, and in internet almost becoming a, a commodity for uh, in most of our lives, right? And if you then look at the last decade, which is the current decade that we're living, which is from 10, 20, 2010 to, uh, sorry, 2010 to 2020, uh, this decade has been, uh, you know, the uh, it has been about the event of applications and how mobile has now become a non-separable part of our, of our lives. You know, if you're talking about 5 billion plus people uh, on mobile devices these days, uh, almost 66 or 67% of the world population are on, on mobile, which is, which is humongous, right? What he said is, uh, it will be very interesting, which he said that the next 10 decades will be about experience economy, you know, which basically means the next 10 years, uh, uh, you know, the change that will happen uh, in the next 10 years will be faster than what we've seen in the last 50 years. So uh, what, has it, what, what has last two years done? The last two years has actually empowered our customers uh, quite, a, quite a bit you know, in, in, in terms of what they can choose, what they can view, the decisions that they, they can make, the data, the data that they have available with, with us, right? And, they, and as we see, as we talk uh, right now, and we're living in a challenging environment, experience economy is already changing the way we run businesses. Right? The, the, the advent of new technologies in terms of uh, uh, AI, machine learning, robotics, all of it is kind of changing uh, the world. Now, uh, it has never been easier for customers to evaluate uh, the companies uh, that, they, that they choose from, right? Uh, products uh, are, are, you know, if you look at products operationally, you know, pick, pick up any bank or phone or, or cars and you compare them feature on feature, you won't see a big difference. I think the biggest difference that uh, or brands are trying to make here these days is, is, is about the experience that they provide, right? 60% of customers today are willing to pay more just to have better experience, right? Like because the parity of product is is completely is changing, right? Like to, to my previous point, if you 15 years back, our, pro, our our marketing strategy was aligned to the product, right? Talk now, our our marketing strategy cannot be aligned to our product because products are are almost at at par. Our our marketing strategy is completely aligned to uh, to the customers. So organizations need to must continuously listen to the to the beliefs, the emotions of the customer, what are they looking for, et cetera, right? So uh, just hold that thought for a bit when I say that uh, 
you know, our, our uh, the customer has become more powerful. If you divide the current uh, organization structure, pick up the company and divide them divide into three halves, the back office, the middle office, and the front office. Uh, the CEO of the company has a very clear leader in the back office as CFO, right? He has a very clear leader and in the middle office as the COO. But if you uh, look at the front office, there are multiple contenders for it. There's sales organization who is, who is front, you know, talking to the customers. There's customer management organization who's talking. Marketing engages with uh, in, in the front space. But the point is marketing is the only function uh, that uh, touches and impacts the, the customers from the beginning of the buyer journey to towards the end of the buyer's journey as, as, as we all know, right? So talk, talking about the customer's buyer's journey, and I'm sure you would have seen this chart before in some form or the other, but this is a chart that's something I, I, I kind of very fond of, but when we are marketing to, to customers these days, we either start too early uh, in, the, in, the, in the buying cycle where we're trying to get them on board or you know uh, make them, buy our product or or we start at the at the very bottom where we are trying to retain our customers in some form or the other right uh, but what we when when a customer these days is is surfing online or you know even shops or uh, you know watching an advertising a customer when is going through this buyer journey they're looking for answers right and i think as marketeers if we are able to answer those questions when a customer is going through a buyer journey, I think we do a, we'll do a phenomenal job uh, as marketeers, right? Um, and that's where I feel that you know content plays one of the most critical roles when you are aligned to the uh, aligning yourself with the buyer journey of, of a customer. So uh, what content is being is produced is extremely important without doubt, but how that content is being distributed plays an even important role uh, in, in today's day and age, right? So uh, we've, seen, we've seen this slide before or heard of this before, like 60 to 70% of our content is getting, uh, is goes unused because, you know, it's not, the, it's not, sometimes the content quality is not good, but more often than not, that content is sitting at some, it's at some wrong location, right? Uh, you would have seen the email, uh, uh, the, 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 the situation of our emails these days, people don't click on our banners, etc. So the, the reality is, if we are producing 100% of content, 70% of that content is is uh, uh, sort of getting uh, uh, untapped or untouched. Now, what I want you to cover is give a, a very, very basic fundamental principle of how content marketing and how effective uh, uh, you know, content marketing work, can work to align to a bias journey. Now, effective content marketing is a, is, a, is a very powerful tool that allows you to not just bring your potential customers along the, the journey, but hopefully uh, convert them into, into sales, right? So to, to be able to do that, your content has to be relevant, which is you know, a no-brainer uh, in order to be in, truly effective. Uh, you need to know what your customers are looking for. You need to be, uh, you know, uh, personal. I mean, personalization is one of the biggest trends uh, in the in the industry as we talk, right? Uh, but again, we need to be very careful of uh, how much personal content is. I mean, do we go hyper personal by, you know, I don't think our customers today would want to know uh, or would want to share of where his or her daughter or son goes to school with, or you know, uh, what did the customer bought in a shop, uh, a shop in a particular day, or where is he going to on Tuesday? That's hyper personalization. I think we, from a from personalization perspective, I think we need to stay broadly relevant, right? We need to know enough that can, that can help us drive a message which is broader in nature. That when it hits the customer, the customer is able to share that content with uh, with like-minded people or similar persona, right? So personalization is very important. Educational, like I mentioned, uh, it's very important for our customers to. Uh, learn about the solutions. Like I mentioned, it, it, he, the customer is looking for answers when he's or he or she is moving along the, the, the bias journey, right? Then we are we are we addressing the the, the interests of the customer at the right time? Uh, obviously, the basics whether they have the right call to action and it demonstrates the solution. I mean, are you are you uh, able to you know clearly uh, communicate what is the value prop of your of your of your of your, of your uh, product? Right? And in terms of type of content, there are typically two types of content. Uh, one is uh, uh, 
topical content, which basically means which is which could be related to uh, you know an, a festival or a sport or it could be you know, for example Christmas or soccer. And evergreen content is something that can be used uh, uh, at a various stages of a buyer's journey. The, the how-to articles, the guides, the tutorials, etc. Right. So this is this is this slides basically communicates that the basics of having an effective content marketing strategy. But if you keep creating content uh, and no one sees it, it does no good, right? So we need to change our mindset and, and also invest time, energy, money, resources on uh, a strong distribution channel. So I'm gonna cover a few basic um, uh, you know, elements that, in, that, that makes, uh, makes for a strong uh, content distribution strategy. Number one is platform. Like before publishing any content, it's important to uh, assess your 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 content platforms. You know, tailoring your content uh, uh, and platform to your audience, and making sure that uh, you you prevent wastage and make sure you are efficient uh, when 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 you're in you're delivering your content to a customer. So, what are the three, these are the three considerations when you are evaluating a platform? One is is need content need. Will your content add value and solve the problem for your for your audience that and in that particular moment uh, second is your audience ecosystem is your content right for that particular platform i mean it, 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 this sounds very basic but I, but honestly we, we don't ask these questions to ourselves we actually flow uh, with with what with everybody is doing but then these are the questions you need to ask yourself uh, when you are uh, going and and working on a, on a on a broadcasting strategy and third obviously is proposition and format is the content that you are proposing right for the platform that you're choosing I mean that gives me I mean if you look at this chart very very basic chart again but uh, honestly speaking when I when sometimes I'm working on my content plan I don't ask these questions to myself this table shows the different forms of content uh, content and what works best for each in individual channels. As you can see, Facebook and Twitter supports a wide range of content, but if you move further down, LinkedIn may not do that, right? Just to make sure that you're using the right content in the right channel at the right time to maximize the, the platform to its best usage is some of the questions that we need to ask ourselves as a marketer. I don't think we ask that too frequently. Uh, the, the, ne the next slide is about uh, content seeding. So uh, content seeding is a very, very uh, strategic approach to mapping out your content across the entire uh, uh, internet, Web, uh, right? It can, it, it can be split across online platforms. It can, have, can, it can be on websites. Uh, it can be on social media channels. Uh, so optimizing your uh, content uh, to cater to a platform is a very, very important consideration so that you avoid any overlap, right? Or to avoid any wastage. I mentioned that in the beginning where, you know, 60 to 70% of our content goes completely unused. So there are a few factors uh, that get impacted if you get your content strategy right. First is reach, right? This allows your content to reach uh, a wider audience uh, more than uh, just a static platform. Uh, relevancy, I think I already spoke about that, how relevant uh, is your content on the right platform for the right audience? Uh, second is brand building. It, it helps your uh, brand build the credibility if you're on the right platform, uh, uh, build thought leadership within an industry, and eventually it, it actually helps you build demand. I mean, normally when you look at content seeding, we don't see content seeding as a, as a, as a platform to generate demand for us. But if you look at some of the research that have been done recently in the market, Content seeding is a, is a great platform for us to give us long-term demand. You know, if you look at from a, from a B2B perspective, six to eight months is, is a cycle that we should look at. Unfortunately, we don't look beyond two to three months these days, and that's where kind of we are, we are struggling. Now, this is an important factor, distribution channel. Again, a very, very, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm talking about my personal experience as well. You don't uh, look at channels this way. You look at channels the way your agency is recommending them. You don't sometimes forget asking them these very, very basic questions to yourself. So uh, channels can be divided into three you know, broad categories. Like there's a own channel. So these are channels that you, that you own 100%. You have autonomy over it. These channels have offered the best opportunity for you to uh, you know, shape your message, uh, you know, you know, 
have your creative in place, have the right content, it's, it's, et cetera. Uh, the challenge with using the owned space is that it, it, is, it is a bit confined because it's only your platform and you will only be talking to audiences in that particular community. So the a typical example of an own medium is a Facebook page owned by a company, Twitter uh, page, Instagram page, et cetera, YouTube channel, right? These are controlled by organizations and you can push whatever you want uh, on these channels. Second challenge with the own medium is that it becomes too product focused. It becomes too much about yourself versus being broadly relevant to an organization. So I think that's something which, which has a limitation uh, when you're working with only in an own environment, a collaborative uh, uh, you know, channel. Uh, these channels are online communities coming together to share and create content, right? Leaving your content in these communities uh, benefits the user-generated content, making sure that users actually feel part of the journey. Uh, they, they feel part of the creating process. You may not even, uh, uh, you know, you can actually do some testing uh, when you are uh, as part of as part of the collaborative channel, right? So, you know, some examples are Reddit or or forums. So the LinkedIn uh, communities that you see is, is a great platform for you to have a collaborative where you actually form groups, not branded groups, but non-branded groups that can help you drive some of some of the content uh, uh, for the audience. And lastly, is earned and paid. And earned and paid channels represent a great opportunity for content marketers uh, by leveraging already engaged audiences or networks in some form or the other, right? So I think, uh, uh, it, you know, the, the influencer marketing is, is huge. I think I've covered this in, 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 in a slide future somewhere. Uh, no, I think I missed that slide. So yeah, I mean, influencer marketing is huge these days. Like basically you use, uh, you know, industry influencers to market your brand, you know, even even blogging when you when you are going into, out into, into, into market, actually the next slide might cover that one, yeah. So when it comes to, uh, is my slide changing? Yeah, uh, uh, choosing the right content promotion is, uh, a, the fourth and uh, important element when you when you are working on a, on, on a broadcasting strategy for your for your content uh, I was mentioning what influencer marketing this involves using influencers to create and and co-create uh, uh, you know uh, uh, your your brand messaging uh, blogging this works fantastic with b2b brands this involves ex extending the reach of your blogs by using influencers and and executives in market who actually ma make a big difference tagging your, your content to, to the audiences and channels. Again, a very, very basic uh, fundamental, but goes a long way uh, uh, when you do this right for your, for your brands. Affiliate marketing, where this involves teaming up with like-minded businesses to create content together. You know, great examples of a Nike partnering with uh, uh, you know, an energy company or in the B2B space, for example, SAP partners with uh, uh, AWS, Amazon Works Web Services from a data management perspective, right? So these, uh, when two big brands come together, uh, they, they go a long way. Uh, media partnership obviously is, uh, is, a, is a paid form of promotion where you work with third party mediums, you know, uh, uh, to amplify your brand message. Uh, Red Bull partnering with GoPro or a lot of infill marketing and advertising that we, that we see these days is a, is a great example of, of media partnership that uh, uh, is a great example of a, a great content distribution strategy. Uh, lastly, uh, that I had on, on, my, on my chart was content repurposing. Uh, again, uh, uh, from, a, from a distribution perspective, something that we don't do very, very effectively these days, but it's, it's, it's a method of reusing uh, content in various, I mean, we, we use it in some forms, but I think there's a huge scope of, of, of uh, various different formats to make it um, fit for purpose. You know, but uh, you know, uh, don't just tire it by, by using a single asset in a single format. The benefits of this uh, uh, is is basically you uh, have an efficient resource helping drive consistency of message and extending the life of your, of your content. So I think repurposing uh, your content uh, goes a long way when it comes to content distribution and discovery. And uh, example, a, a simple blog can be repurposed from an, an infographic to uh, uh, an AV to even a, even, a, even, a, even a podcast. I mean, we do this a lot in the, in the B2B space, but I think 
repurposing of content is is uh, a great tool to uh, to you know uh, amplify your content and have and and have a great uh, uh, distribution strategy for your content. So I mean, these are the few uh, practices I wanted to kind of share with you, uh, uh, which I feel with you know can can provide some legs to your uh, content. It's not just about creating the, in the right content, but making sure that you are using the right uh, channels, right tools uh, to make sure your, uh, your, your content is reaching the right audience. Uh, asking yourself the basic questions before you, before you go to market, you ask those questions to yourself. I think that goes uh, a long way. So that's it from me. Uh, thanks, Arfi.